My name is Monk Rowe, and we're filming today for the Hamilton College Jazz Archive. And I'm very pleased to have with me Mr. John Hendricks. Thank you, Monk. That's a great name. It was, <laughs> it I'm works. used to that name. It works. I bet you've said that a few times. <laughs> yes, <already>. I have. <laughs> uh, it's, it's great to have the greatest exponent of a very specific style of jazz singing with us. And uh, ah, thank you. I hope we can see if we can understand that a little better today. Ah. You, uh, you go back a ways, and I, I read that you used to be accompanied by Art Tatum. For two years in a, in a nightclub in Toledo, my hometown, that also his hometown. And uh, I knew him all my life, actually, because mm -hmm. I started singing at nine professionally. I started at seven. Uh, as I say in my act, uh, I started singing at seven professionally at nine. Before that, I was a bum. Later around the house, didn't do nothing. <laughs> You took a few years <laughs> off in your early life, okay. Yeah, we but uh, understand that. Uh, Art and I uh, played uh, all the amateur shows around Toledo. He started out on the violin, you know. Mm -hmm. His ambition was to, was to be another Yasha Heifetz. And uh, his mother thought to help him with his violin, she'd get him a piano. Mm -hmm. And he sat down to that piano, and boy, mm -hmm. This, That's all she wrote. It, that was it. Yeah. That was it. Was he, was he a good accompanist? Yes. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Because we were so used to hearing him playing so much piano mm -hmm. that he must have been able to cut back a little bit to know to, to accompany the singing. Or, well, or how did that work? Well, for what he did was he played a lot, you know, but he left the melody open so mm -hmm. that what he played surrounded you. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, like a good arranger yeah. would do. Like uh, Klaus Ugermann did for Gerard Gilberto on the, the album called Amoroso. He, mm -hmm. he, he didn't get it in Gilberto's way, but, but uh, if you hear those tunes without the strings, you, you see what he did. You yeah. know? He, just, he just filled everything out. And, and, and that's what Art did. He knew the melody to everything. Uh -huh. So he left that to you, to the, to the singer, great. and everything else he just put there. The stuff you were singing at that time, the music was, was it jazz or was it the popular songs uh, of the day? Or at that at that so at that at that time, the music of America was jazz. Mm -hmm. you know? Popular music uh, exists because of jazz. You know, I mean the the rhythm is the, is the key. Yeah. Uh, what makes country and western music you know is the is the beat because before that it was green sleeve yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> music from the, from across the ocean yeah right it, it, before it, we... it was the ballads or or the uh, you know the european music is is simply music with the rhythm removed mm -hmm. when stravinsky put them put the put the african rhythms back into european music with Le Sacre du Printemps in 1920, 20, 21, I think it was. It cost two days of rioting yeah. in Paris, yeah. you know. They didn't know what to do with that. Yeah, because <laughs> they, hadn't heard, they hadn't heard that. But, it, but that's the essence of American popular music, uh -huh. is, the, is the, like, as, as Duke says, it don't mean a thing if it ain't got that swing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Did you have a musical family? No, my fa I, had a, I had a religious family. My father was a minister. My mother was a sister in the church, and uh, she wrote lyrics to spirituals. Ah. She was very good. That's where, that's where I came by yeah. my, my uh, love of rhyming and uh -huh. literature, too, because she always read uh, a lot. And uh, I used to help my father with his uh, sermons by, you know, he would have me pick uh, passages from the Bible. And then uh, he would he would preach a sermon based on this this uh, certain passage or passages, like I'd pick a passage of maybe two or three verses, you know. Mm -hmm. And he would expand on that, and I would listen to to him. I, first, I would read the passages, you know, and I would uh, I, I would not understand the the meaning because the first place I was too young. Mm -hmm. But then when I went to church that Sunday and I heard him preach this whole sermon on these two or three verses, 
I was amazed at the at the body of knowledge that can be contained in s such a short mm -hmm. space, you know, as far as words were concerned. Yeah, and, and he said, just expanded on that. Yeah, so so even to this day, when I write a lyric, I try to construct a line so that within that line there's a, there's a there's, there's a whole chapter of a book, you know. Mm. If you stop and think wow. about it, this you, you know you can make, uh, and that's where I learned that from. Maybe that's why what writer I think it was Time Magazine called you the James Joyce of Jai. Yeah. Right? <laughs> if you've heard that, <laughs> I was so flattered by that. I went and read James Joyce yes. over again because okay. I had read him when I was yeah. in, in English because that was yeah. my major, you know. Uh -huh. And and I had read uh, Joyce like uh, like you know. You know, kind of half an eye on it, you know, because mm -hmm. I was I, I was always trying to trying trying to write tunes and think of tunes, and I never paid that much attention. Uh -huh. But but when that man uh, said that about me in Time Magazine, <laughs> I went back and read James Joyce, <laughs> and I see why he saw fit to do that, because Joyce used language uh, the, the way jazz mm -hmm. uh, uh, players used uh, used used. You know the songs they play right. as a point of departure. Yeah. He he took language and just departed into whole worlds. You know, yeah. of uh, words. When did you get the first idea of listening to an improvised solo <laughs> and and doing what you do with it? I have to laugh because <laughs> because uh, I'm just thinking about all that stuff. You know, because. Yeah. I'm going to write my book, you know. Good. So I begin. I've, I've started to think about that, and it's amazing uh, where I got the idea to write what, what is now known as vocalese was when I was a kid. You know, it was in the middle of the depression, and you you have no idea how hard times were in the depression. I mean, people talk of hard times now. These are luxury hard times, uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> you know, compared to those yeah. times. Uh, Red Fox uh, ha had something in his act about that. He said, uh, times were so hard that one day my father was sitting on the front step and he hollered up and said, Martha, the garbage man's coming. And she said, tell him to leave three cans. <laughs> Oh, that's hard. <laughs> that is hard. That's right. Times were tough, and we that there were, there were, my father, my mother, and fifteen children. Whoa. Twelve boys and three girls in 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 the depression. So it was very very difficult. So I didn't have a nickel to buy popcorn and a dime to go in, in, into the movie theater. Mm -hmm. You know, with all my brothers and sisters, you know, my father just couldn't afford to give everybody a dime uh, to get in and a nickel to buy popcorn. Yeah. So we all had to find some way of uh, finding 15 cents on Saturday to go to the movies, you know. And so my brothers would go out and f what we call junk, you know, they would, they, they would go junking, which mm -hmm. was, they'd, they'd walk through the alleys. At that time, every, every street had a, had a back part, you know, which was the alley. And, and uh, pe people would throw away things, uh, papers, uh, old lamps that broke, you know, all these they, they would pick up mm -hmm. in, a, in, a, in a wagon or a cart and take them to the junkyard. And uh, you'd be surprised how, how everything's worth something. Yeah. And this guy would buy the, the things off of them maybe for 25 cents. Well, there, there's a quarter you got, you, you, you can take somebody else to the movies, and you got a nickel for the popcorn, you know. So uh, we used to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, I used to go into the men's room of the bus station or the train station, and when somebody was going to put a nickel in, into, the, in, into the slot to go to the lavatory, I'd say, wait a minute, you know. Just, you know, just give me the nickel. And I would crawl one down and one and eight, open the door, and, and make... 15 cents after I did that three times, I would go to the movies oh. and have a, have a nickel for, you know, for the popcorn. Then I, then I found out something else. People played the jukebox mm -hmm. and it cost a nickel. So I loved all that stuff that was on the jukebox and I could, I could hum most of those songs. So I said, why don't you learn, why don't you learn those songs, you know? And I, so I, I would learn the solos, you know? Uh -huh. 
And then I would stand in front of the jukebox, and when somebody was going to play, I said, wait a minute, don't, don't put the nickel in yet. What are you going to play? And they would say, Yard Dog Mazurka by Jimmy Lunsford. I said, don't put it in there. Give it to me, and I'll sing it. Oh, man. <laughs> and they couldn't resist that, yeah. you know. So they would give me the nickel, and I would sing, <laughs> I would sing the whole thing solo and all, and the whole place would be lit. Oh, that's fantastic. And how old were you then? I was about 13. Oh, man. And I would earn enough money, and, and then I would go to the movies. You know? And I forgot about that. Yeah. Until I, I, start... I wrote Sing a Song of Basie. And I said, hey, yeah, I know how to do this. Yeah. You know? <laughs> I have to ask you about that. I mean, this... this uh... I know I'm skipping some years in your life. <laughs> I hope so. You did some non-music <laughs> jobs, I bet, on the oh, way out. Oh, boy. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. Oh, boy. Paid that, some dues. I say that's, that that's the period at which my feet touch the ground. You know? yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because music keeps you uh, right. up, in the, it, up, up, up in the air. You it kind of makes you appreciate when you can make a living making music. Absolutely. From the other it's the most wonderful do. gift in the world, yeah. I think. Yeah. You know? Well, when you did this... Sing a song of Basie. It seems like a tremendous amount of writing went into this. Did it, yes. did it take a long time? Yeah. Every song, yeah. every move, yeah. every way, yeah. everywhere yeah. I get blue yeah. and don't care. Yeah. I run away and I can't find they found me. There. It took, uh, uh, a shorter time to write it than it did to learn it. Yeah. Uh, like the, uh, I can attest to the to the spirituality of the creative process. You know, mm -hmm. that there have been symposia on that. You know, yeah, people have have talked about that, and uh, I know that when you're when you're in the process of creating something, you become God's pencil. Mm. You know, because you're watching the pencil to see what's coming out. Oh. So if you're the one doing it, it, you wouldn't have to do that. You would know what's coming out. But all during Sing a Song of Basie, I would, I would be watching the pencil to see what, oh. was, wow. what was coming, you know. And it was almost like revealed writing. You know, it just came. And to this day, if I do a lyric, I do the whole band with the solos and all in one draft. And I go back, and maybe I have to change one or two words here, but it just pours out right. Wow. Sounds uh, like how Mozart wrote, from what I've read. Yeah. Just, I, think, I, I think it's revealed. That's great. I, I think just, that's the way it is. Yeah. Um, and this was, I think, one of the first ones where this, you did multi-tracking on this. Obviously. This was the first everything. It's the first time the lyrics were put on the back. Mm -hmm. I insisted on that because I, I said, look, nobody's going to know what, what we're singing. Yeah. <laughs> it's, and it's like a, it's like a vocabulary lesson in, in, in what was happening at the time. Is, that's, are, that's did they funny call you it jive? That. I mean, what did they call this, this kind of um, language? Or maybe it didn't have a name. Leonard, it didn't have a name. Leonard Feather gave it the name Vocalese. Okay. And that, that stuck. That, but Ralph Gleason, uh, when he was writing for the San Francisco Chronicle, wrote wrote a, a wonderful column on on what you just remarked on. He mm -hmm. said someday, in the future, sociologists will refer to John Hendrix's lyrics to see how people spoke in the fifties and sixties. Uh -huh. And I thought I was very oh, flattered boy. by that. You know, that was very flattering. Yeah. But I think it's I think uh -huh. it's true, because. The lyrics are full of uh, vulgate expressions mm -hmm. that that, uh, that were very much in use at one time, mm -hmm. but but are not very very much use today. You know. And you had a quite a wonderful association with Count Basie. Oh uh, yeah, <laughs> it was gorgeous. <laughs> he was a great man. I mean, he, he was great uh, in a, in such a quiet way. You know, mm -hmm. it, it, it it wasn't any flamboyance about him. What it was about him, I think, was his magnetism, you know? He just sat still 
and was quiet, but nothing happened until he moved. I mean, the band would be on the bandstand, and they would, everybody would be sitting there, and he'd come, he'd come and make that introduction, and the whole band would come to life. You know? oh. He and Duke Ellington had, the, had, had yeah. that, same, that same thing, and Basie was so, uh, so honest. You know, he was such an honest man that it was funny. He, 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 you, he, I mean, it was a joke the way he, he would, he would uh, just let the truth come out of his mouth. Like one time we went to London with him, and uh, he asked me to come by his hotel, you know, uh, because he was going to do an interview with the London Times. <laughs> and he was kind of uh, worried about it, you know, and uh, wanted to make sure that everything went well. Yeah. So, so he wanted me there in case uh, uh, you know I, I, I had to translate for the, <laughs> <laughs> for the yeah. reporter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there was some difference in how the English language was used between <laughs> the London Times and... <laughs> so this man says, he sits down and he says, uh, tell me, Mr. Bassey. <laughs> he says, you have a style of playing the piano. He says, you don't seem to play too many notes. <laughs> You're sort of uh, economical in your style of playing. He says, how did you arrive at such a style? And basically said, I just can't play no more piano. <laughs> <laughs> and I, was, I, of course, was yeah. sitting over here yeah. talking. <laughs> and I went into the bathroom and cracked up. Because <laughs> it, was, it was so true, yeah. but totally unexpected. Yeah. Yeah. And then when we... <laughs> <laughs> when we saw the uh, the article the next day, mm -hmm. the guy remarked on how how uh, Mr. Basie was so so uh, what did he call it uh, so modest. Mm. <laughs> he said he was so modest. <laughs> he wasn't modest. He just he was, he was telling the truth. Yeah. You know the one o'clock jump. If you listen to that record, yeah. Basie could only play an E flat. In E flat. When he started out, that was it. E flat, and that song uh, is in D. You know, when the band comes in, so he plays his two courses in E flat. Then he makes the modulation uh -huh. to D, and the band plays. <laughs> <laughs> and then he can kind of lay out and just do his yeah, he can thing just here and there. Note, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, he played well, like his personality. Is that a fair statement? Well, he, he became a great piano player. Yeah. He became a great piano uh -huh. player because this was at the beginning. Yeah. But boy, he could play. He really could play because mm -hmm. he found exactly the right note at the right time. Mm -hmm. And if you were, you were playing in his band, if you were soloing and you ran out of ideas, he was listening and he would play something and feed you, you know, the next whole course, you know, uh -huh. which would just, you know, just one or two notes, you know. It's a, such a gift. Yeah. And it, it's a good lesson for younger players, too, to dig the economy of, of notes and what a few notes can do. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, this, the, on the, the sequel to the Basie thing, you used Joe Williams as your yes, fourth voice. Yes, yes. That was the best time of my whole life, oh. singing-wise, uh -huh. to have a Dave, Annie, and Joe. Mm-hmm. Oh, that was a perfect group, because Joe's beautiful, rich, syrupy baritone, mm -hmm. you know, at the bottom of that stuff, just what it needed. It was so wonderful. Yeah. I'll never forget that. In fact, we, we still talk about it, Joe and yeah. I still talk about that. He, he still talks about that. Yeah. You know, it was so wonderful. And he was just like a student. He did, you know, he didn't uh, act like a star or anything. Mm -hmm. He says, what do you want me to do? And I, I said, well, I want you to, to do J.J. Johnson's solo on uh, uh, Rambo, you know. Mm -hmm. He says, okay. And, I, and he really did it, you know. He hit the notes right. Uh -huh. so he was beautiful. That's he great. Was, he's great. How has uh, recording changed from then till now for you? Well, a lot. A lot. I, I think in, in the first place, not just recording, but the whole music industry. Yeah. In those days, the, the music industry was wisely left uh, to the artists. Mm -hmm. You know, the heads of all the record companies were musicians and artists. 
they had their, their business departments with their lawyers and their bookkeepers and their bean counters and all. They yeah. were there. Yeah. But the, the decisions, you know, that affected the work were made by artists so that you had great productivity from all the record companies. The guy at the head of RCA, Victor, uh, played with the Philadelphia Symphony Orchestra. He played the clarinet and the bassoon. The head of Columbia Records was Goddard Lieberson. Goddard Lieberson uh, worked in the English music halls. He could play the piano and mm -hmm. do a dance for you, you know. He was, he was an artist. Uh, and it was the same at... Uh, Decca was headed by Milt Gabler. Milt Gabler opened up his own record company at 17 and knew the names of every great jazz musician, you know, and had a great love for the music. Mm -hmm. But nowadays, they have taken the, the uh, lawyers and the accountants and the bean counters from the business department and put them no, in the charge country. of the music. Well, put a fox in charge of the chicken coop and see wow. how many chickens you have left at the end of the... Of the Mm -hmm. of the summer, you know. You'll have a lot of feathers, but there won't be no chickens. <laughs> and that's the way it is. You got a lot of you got a lot of people recording, but where's the great art? You know? Uh-huh. Yeah. That's kind of a shame. Yeah. But uh, you still managed to put out some good product. Well I, I, I and it's it's wonderful of like you have your family singing with you. Well well that's a matter of, of uh of sheer necessity, you know, because <laughs> <laughs> I say in my act, you know, the only way to find good young jazz singers today is you have to raise them yourself. <laughs> and it's actually yeah. true, you know, yeah. because um, people go to school, you know, to, to, to study jazz, the, the Berkeley School of Music, the Manhattan School of Music, where my daughter is now, incidentally. Mm -hmm. uh, and to give, you, give an example of their attitude, we're going uh, on a little mini tour uh, next Tuesday. We're going to go to Bucharest, for, you know, and sing in Romania, and then do s several dates in Germany, and then go to Paris and do a, the opening of a nightclub. Manhattan School of Music won't let my daughter out of her jazz studies. Oh, Lord. To come and do a jazz gig with me, that? who am a school unto myself. You believe that. It's unbelievable. She would learn. <laughs> she would learn a year's worth with you. Well, she already oh. she already has been singing with us yes. for several years, and she she knows a lot. But the experience, she could come back and speak to the other students. About. Yeah, you know, it, it's so to me. It's it's, it's just uh, it's like standing on your head and writing a commentary on life. Mm. You know, mm -hmm. because. Uh, it, it's a backwards way of looking at things, mm -hmm. and and you find this now very prevalent. You have people coming out of jazz schools uh, into you know the jazz scene without the main thing they need. They have the notes, you know. They can play all the notes, up and down every scale. They they know uh, the names of every chord but they don't know anything about the culture that made the music mm -hmm. possible. They don't know anything about the society from which the music came, of which the music is an expression. Mm -hmm. They don't know anything about the love and the, and the feeling of collectivism, of love for each other, of consideration for your fellow musician, right. that is is that is the key to the music being played yeah. really correctly. They know nothing about that. They know everything from up here. They know the notes on the paper, but the notes on the paper are not the music. The music comes from the heart. And it's so important because jazz, and especially, was was so important in breaking some of the racial. Uh, Problems down. Absolutely. You know, like, like Benny Lyle Goodman. Was, yeah. Benny Goodman is an American social hero. He is a he is a hero in in the development of American society. Outside of music, Benny Goodman is a social hero mm -hmm. because his love for the music was so pure that he just did not understand why he couldn't have Lionel Hampton in his band. Mm -hmm. 
and then Charlie Christian, and then Teddy Wilson, you know. He just didn't understand that. And, and, the, and the bean counters and the accountants and the lawyers, they tried to explain to him, Benny, you lose your show. You, they will not renew you on the camel caravan if you do this. So you know, they gave him all those, those uh, uh, very hard and, and, and fast business reasons, mm -hmm. but he refused to understand them. Mm. He said, I like those guys. Yeah. <laughs> They play the music I want, so they stay. Right? Oh, so, so he did what people have to march now to achieve. Yeah, yeah. You know, <laughs> and it's it's because of the power of the music, the love of the music. Uh -huh. I was just talking to Lionel's man over there, and I asked how how's Lionel doing. He says, well, he's okay, but he's got this gig uh, ne next week, you know, coming up yeah. at the Blue Note. I said, that's no problem. I said, as long as the music plays, he's all right. You yeah. know, he'll be cool. <laughs> yeah. It's when the music stops that you have to worry. Yeah, yeah. Well, his, you know, one of his last records here says, for the love of music. Yeah, you know, that's, exactly. That's what it's exactly. all about. Exactly. Uh, if I can jump back for one minute, I have to sure. ask you oh, about... Please. I have to ask you about uh, Cloudburst. I, I mean, I constantly you know. <laughs> digress, so keep me in line. <laughs> I mean... Uh, the song Cloudburst was was that based on a was it Wardle Gray solo? No, no, uh, that was that's a that's a tragic story. Because <laughs> you know all all of the, the the guys that came out of the bands when when the, when the, when the big bands began to break up, you know Chick Webb's band, all of them went into some aspect of the music business to try to continue to make a, li a living with music, and uh, Chick Webb's uh, guitarist uh, name was Levar Kirkland. Mm -hmm. And he was one of Chick Webb's main arrangers, you know, fine musician. And he was around Broadway trying to uh, make a living uh, selling songs, writing songs, conducting uh, rhythm and blues, recording dates, you know, doing anything he, he could. And he finally got, uh, got a gig from uh, uh, MGM Records. That they wanted him to do an album of uh, great uh, rock type, uh, rhythm and blues type, uh, flag-waving type songs, you know. And so he was, uh, he thought this was beneath him, you know. Mm -hmm. But the money was good. Yeah. So he figured, okay, he would make this album, uh, and there was a song that he wanted uh, to record on the album called Cloud Burst that was written by two great jazz musicians, uh, uh, Leroy himself and a trumpet player named Benny Harris, who was a legendary mm -hmm. trumpet player, played with Dizzy, played with Bird for a while, but died of a, an overdose very mm -hmm. early, you know, but a very hip musician, and they wrote this song called Cloudburst. So he would figure, he, he figured, okay, well, since I'm part of the tune, I, I wrote part of it, I'll call the album Cloudburst. Mm -hmm. And I'll call myself Claude Cloud, <laughs> and I'll call the orchestra the Thunderclaps. So it was Claude Cloud and his Thunderclaps. <laughs> Playing Cloudburst. Wow. <laughs> with, the, with the album featuring Cloudburst. Uh -huh. you know? And he thought, well, that, that'd be a good place to hide, whoever heard this yeah. album, and, and decided, oh, man, what is Leroy doing here? Yeah. It was a smash hit. <laughs> oh, Lord. <laughs> So he is poor Leroy Kirkland, collecting all that money, and very sad because of all these years of struggle. Yeah. Nobody still knows his name. <laughs> <laughs> he pulled a fast one on himself. On himself. Oh, <laughs> oh man, that's great. You know, we used to joke it when we saw him. We'd say, Claude. He said, Don't. Give <laughs> <my God." laughs> but that that oh. that solo you did on that tune goes by... Sam the Man Taylor. I'm talking about... the one that played that. Yeah. yeah. I, I, goes, I just lyricized his... It goes his by solo. so fast... Yeah. ...that every time I hear it, I go, <laughs> how'd you do that? How'd you do that? <laughs> did, they, did they record you at 33 and then press it at 78 or something? Well, I mean, it's well, just... I think, I think I should tell you that, uh, that I actually uh, studied law. My major was English. 
my minor was history and I, and I was a law student. And I have 18 months to get my law degree. And uh, I got the only A in speech class in four years. <laughs> and I got the only A in the creative writing class in seven years. And uh, so I'm a, I was a bit of a, a, a academic star mm -hmm. you know, for that because the guy that wrote the book on uh, creative writing, Dr. Milton Marks, was well known. He, he, I think he won a Pulitzer Prize, and he's well known in all the, in, in the university levels, especially all the English departments. You know, so I, I knew how to use words, and I, I knew uh, all, all about that. But as far as the, is uh, speaking that fast, uh, I would have said to myself, "I'll have to slow this down." You know, but I found that when I started to sing it. The, the uh, speed aspect of it disappeared. Wow. I just sang it. I was blue and I was always wearing a frown Because my girl had turned me down Then we met and it's the man I knew from the first You were my love Cause that's when the old gray town burst My heart really blew the day you crossed my eye I hope that we do Well, it's a classic, I'll tell you that. <laughs> Well, that's, that, that's a very high praise. <laughs> that's high praise coming from you. I thank you very yeah. much for that. Because all it is is fun to me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love that. I thought that was, that's one of your best albums, really, with, with everybody's bopping on it. Oh, and, yeah. I know there's certain tunes that seem to, to follow you around, like yeah. with Lionel of Flying Home, he's still recording it. And then you did uh, Everybody's Bopping yeah. on this one, too. I did a lyric to Flying Home. He just asked me about it. Uh -huh. I told him I have to, I have to look for it. It's yeah. It in one of my storage boxes, you know. Mm -hmm. I have stuff in storage because uh, I have my house in uh, Mill Valley. And uh, the, the stuff that I have is, you know, just won't fit in the average New York apartment. <laughs> if I put all, the, all my stuff, as George Collins says, in my New York apartment, we'd have to move, you know. Yeah, yeah. So I had to store stuff, but I have, I have that lyric to fly uh -huh. home. I have to go to storage now and, right. look and find that. I hope it's not like what I've heard about Milt Hinton's basement or something, you know. Probably is. <laughs> <laughs> I saw Milt yesterday at the at the, at uh, the shoot. At the shoot. Yeah. yeah. Eighty six. Yeah. I told him. I said, uh, "Did you hear the song that uh, Mr. Clark Terry sang to me?" He says, "No. Which one?" Who is Milton Hinton's lady, Mona? <laughs> <laughs> he fell down. <laughs> oh, what a wonderful! Uh, oh yeah. What's in the immediate future for you? You see, European. Well, I'm going on this tour. this tour. I'm uh, getting together another album. I'm going to do a, a vocalese project. I'm going to lyricize and sing the Miles Davis Round About Midnight album. Oh boy. Yeah, that's going to be a, a labor of love. I love uh -huh. that album. I think it's it's the best uh, jazz album I've heard since Burden is. Right. Do you work at the piano when you do no, this? No, I, I, I don't know just, how to play. You just hear... Uh... I play drums. Yeah. But but I learned from Art Tatum to hear every note in the chord. Mm -hmm. Because he would make me sing. Like he, When I was 13, he, he, he used to say, sing this. <laughs> and I'd go, huh? <laughs> and, but then I, I used to have to come by his house when we started working together in this club, two shows a night. Yeah. You know, I was billed. I had billing. Little Johnny Hendrix, the Sepia Bobby Breen, you know. There's this little child movie star discovered by, oh, oh. I think it was Eddie Cantor, mm -hmm. named Bobby Breen. He made a couple pictures. One was Rhythm on the River. And, and they're, they're very, he was a very big star for a while, for a hot minute. And so they named me Little Johnny Hendrix, the Sefia Bobby Breen, accompanied by Art Tatum. <laughs> I mean, I've got one of those bills myself. I was going to ask. I hope you do. Yeah, she has, she has one of those handbills I'm going to put in my book. Great. But, you know, Art had me come by his house after junior high school every day. All the other kids would go junking, you know, mm -hmm. or uh, chasing after the girls, or football, baseball, or I had to go by, by Art's house, <laughs> and uh, he would he would uh, he, he would play these phrases for me to sing, you know, and he'd say, "Sing this," 
and I noticed, you know, that, that, that his eyes, you know, were closed. So, so I thought, well, you know, he must know something. <laughs> <Oof>. <laughs> you know, so I said, when I start to sing it, I'll close my eyes, you know, and I close my eyes, and I, could, and I found mm -hmm. that subliminally or not, I seemed to hear better with my eyes closed. Uh -huh. I could hear more clearly, you know, it seemed that my sense intake process uh -huh. was, was heightened by, by that. So as a result of that, I never learned to read music. Mm -hmm. And to this day, musicians send me lead sheets, you know. I saw Paquito de Rivera yesterday sent me a lead sheet, a song called No Smoking. And I said, Paquito, I said, what are you trying to do, flatter me? He says, what do you mean? I said, you send me a lead sheet. He says, yes, because I want you to put the words to No Smoke. I said, Paquito, I don't read. <laughs> <laughs> Play said, it once for me, though, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. He says, what? I said, I don't read music. Send me a tape. <laughs> You know, and yeah. I, that, that's why I never learned how yeah. to read, because art made me concentrate on listening. Uh -huh. He would say, listen, listen. So I would go. And, my, and I found my hearing increased and increased uh -huh. and increased until, until uh, now I hear things I don't even want to hear. Mm. I'm, I'm walking down the street and I hear snatches of people's conversations. Mm -hmm. And I almost feel like turning around and, and walking behind yeah. him and saying, wait a minute. <laughs> You're wrong. You're, you can't say that. <laughs> you oh, know, that's, it's, it's really... That's amazing. It, it's really funny. Well, I wish we could talk all night here. Me but, too. Uh, I'm enjoying <laughs> this. This is great. Um, <laughs> I wish you the best of luck with your, your future projects, and I, I can't wait Thank to you. read your book. Oh, yes, that's going to be interesting. I'm, I'm dredging up uh, things that I had completely forgotten about, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, like, I forgot that I had worked with Art Tatum until I started to think about this book. Huh. I, I never told anybody that. Mm -hmm. I forgot about it. And there's one really funny in, uh, incident that, that, I, that I, I remember that's really, uh, it's, it's funny, and, but it's also kind of poignant, you know. Mm -hmm. but it, also points out the philosophy that, that we ha had uh, as my father's children, you know. Like, he, he was a very spiritual man, and uh, he taught us that uh, we were children of the living God, that every man, wo woman, and child on this planet were our brothers and sisters. And never mind that they didn't feel that way. That was their problem. Uh -huh. It was our job to remember that we are brother and sister to every human being. So I find it solved all the racial problems I might have had mm -hmm. because I've never really had any. You know, anybody comes to me, I give them the love mm -hmm. I would give a brother. So if they have animosity toward me, first it's got to get through that. Yeah. And that's pretty hard to get through. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> that's pretty hard to get through. Yes. So I find I have, I have no problem, you know. Mm -hmm. But uh, I also found that it, made me, that it made me blind in a funny kind of way because at about 13 or 14, I sang a song uh, made popular on the radio by, by a guy named Skinny Ennis. Skinny Ennis. Spelled his, his name S K I. Double N A Y, I don't know why, but and he sang this song. Um, the object of my affections can change my complexion from white to rosy red. Ooh, every time you hold Sweet. my hand, <laughs> you know. Yeah. And I, I thought, oh, I'll sing this song. You know? So I would sing that song, and people would throw me money. <laughs> of all my repertoire, yeah. I made more money out of that song. And I used to say, that's my big hit, you know. And it wasn't until I got with Dave and Annie, mm -hmm. and I was uh, 35 years old, that I realized what you were saying. <laughs> <laughs> no wonder they threw me all this money. <laughs> man, oh, man. Isn't that funny? Yeah, but yeah. That, that, is, that is funny, poignant, yeah. uh, grim, but funny. Yeah. It's just funny, you know, because... Uh, 
if I if I had if I accepted race, I would never have sung that song. Mm -hmm. But I, I've never accepted that. Yeah, I don't accept anything but God's children. And I read uh, Paul. God is no respecter of person. So who is man to, to cause all this problem? Mm -hmm. You know, and to have all these all this racial problem, all these politicians talking about the problems between black and white already are expressing gross ungodliness, you know, mm -hmm. and lack of belief in any real God, mm -hmm. you know. And this, I, I, I'll have no part of that. I will not blaspheme like in, in that manner. No, we yeah. can all learn from some of those comments. It's, I just will not have anything to do wonderful. with that. Mankind, that's me. Yeah. I'm, I'm there. You all want right. something for mankind? <laughs> Okay, but okay. I will not compartmentalize him, uh -huh. you know. Wow. Well, on behalf of Hamilton College, and it's been a great, great pleasure having the Poet Laureate of Jazz. <laughs> There's another one someone <laughs> said about great you. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great one. I didn't think of that. I, yeah, okay. Leonard Feather. You Leonard know what Feather. we call Leonard? Yeah. God, God rest his soul. I loved him. He was a dear friend of mine. But we call him Leonard Father. <laughs> 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 Well, you know why? Because Leonard was the definitive jazz critic. Mm -hmm. You know, the, most guys who play take umbrage at, at being criticized by somebody they can't play. Yeah, yeah. Leonard wrote and recorded the first three tunes on Dinah Washington's first album mm -hmm. and played piano mm -hmm. on the day. Yeah. So there you are, you know, he's, he has a right. Right. He, he established has, himself and then... He has bona fides, yeah. you know. Yeah, yeah. So when he criticizes, you, you, you're forced to pay attention, you mm -hmm. know. Great. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for your time. I Mr. thank John. you very much for the opportunity. It's, it's been wonderful. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, I'm the kind that's hard to find Had my hard fast days 